Hi everyone and welcome to Last Week Tonight. This is attorney Arcady Freckman, a New York City personal injury trial attorney, and we're going through your questions and your comments and answering what you want to know about. So let us get started. We left off with this question from Young's World. It was about two weeks ago. He asks, how much is my case worth or an estimate? I have a mild TBI, a traumatic brain injury, with all the testing done from the MRI to the brain and without contrast to vision and hearing tests to nerve testing with machines that is like a taser, MRI, cervical lumbar area of the back with four months of shots to the back and neck and an RFA procedure, that's a radio frequency ablation to the cervical and the neck as well as the lumbar. And I was a passenger, so there's no liability issue. I had PIP insurance, paid all the medicals, there was no lost wages, nor home care services due to IME. The doctor wrote a bogus report. But anyways, just got cleared to work. So call the Lord, let them know, because they said the lawsuit does not start until I'm medically cleared from the doctor. So the lawsuit started about two days ago. And I was out of work since March 12th, 2022. I feel that my lawyers should have fought more for my household but it is what it is. I'm in Detroit, Michigan. I have six kids and I've seen a neurologist for all the brain testing. So any ideas, never been in this situation at 42 years old, the person that hit us had progressive. So seeing what you think and always watch your videos as well, have gotten response back from you. Great, with great energy. Thanks again for your time. Yeah, I mean, look, if you have a traumatic brain injury, if it's a true traumatic brain injury, it could be worth millions of dollars. It could be worth a substantial, substantial amount. We'd have to see how much insurance that other car that hit you from Progressive, how much they have, including any excess and umbrella. So we'd have to do that due diligence. But yeah, it looks like a great case. I don't see really any issues. I'm not sure about what your lawyer was saying about you can't file a lawsuit until you're cleared to work. I don't know why that would be. Maybe according to your state or local rules, we don't really have that in New York. You could file a lawsuit pretty much any time as, as long as you have a clear indication of what your diagnosis is, you file the lawsuit and then later on you just supplement with your lost wages and when you're cleared to go back to work. So I'm not, I'm not sure about that part of it, but it seems like, you know, you have a pretty good case. I just find out how much insurance there is. Keep getting your treatment and, um, and you definitely speak to your lawyer. If you need any kind of consult, feel free to reach out to me if you wanted a second opinion or if you wanted you chat with me, and then I, I know a few lawyers in that area in Detroit and Michigan, so I could re refer you somewhere, but it sounds like you, you have somebody that you're working with. So, okay, no, it sounds like it definitely can be a, a substantial case. Okay, let's go to the next question. The next question is from Jose Liriano de la Cruz, and he says, I have a question about my situation. My name is Jose. I was wondering about three things. I had an accident with a truck in New Jersey, and their policy is five million. I already had three surgeries, one shoulder surgery, two back fusions, L2, L3, and had the last one on my next. I wonder if the truck company insurance will cover the surgery payments or will it be charged with my settlement money? Also, how much will the estimate money I'll get for that? I already have the three surgeries and I have done, and I have one year and four months. Yeah, and no, I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, look, if you had those three surgeries, a shoulder surgery, if it's an arthroscopic surgery, and then you also had two more uh, back fusion, spinal fusion surgeries, altogether, it should be a really large amount. It should be a few million dollars. If you have five million in insurance, it, it could be up to that five million, or it could be a little bit less, but it, it, it's hard for me to say without reviewing the whole file, just from what you're telling me. But if liability is clear, if it was the trucking company's fault, it can be a very substantial case very substantial. So if you, again, if you need any kind of consult, just feel free to text me, the 347-566-9595. I'm happy to schedule a call, discuss it with you, you know, if you need any kind of advice. But yeah, that sounds like, it sounds like a str strong case. Now, in terms of the surgery payment, usually the way it's done is, you know, you, you have to use, if there's no fault available, you could use the no fault to pay for your surgery. You don't have to pay that back. If no fault is somehow exhausted, then you can use, for example, get a lien. And then if you end up using your health insurance or any kind of payment that you make for the surgery where you can then claim 
that money back because that's not something that gets reimbursed. So it depends on if it gets reimbursed. That's known as the collateral source rule, meaning if it gets reimbursed from a collateral source, like no fault, which is PIP or workers comp, or it could be also um, health insurance. You know, if it gets paid by someone else, then, then that, that gets paid by them. But if it doesn't get paid by the collateral source, if you end up having to pay it yourself out of pocket, then you can get that money back as a medical expense. And you can also get future medical expenses if the doctor will say that, hey, hey you're gonna need future surgery, you're gonna need future physical therapy. You can get that as part of your lawsuit, but it has to be pled in the, uh, like in your, in your uh, in, I'm not sure how it is in New Jersey. In New York, we have what's known as a bill of particulars. So you list it in there and you say, I'm gonna have future surgery. It's gonna be this kind of cost. And then the doctor will give the cost projections. And sometimes an economist will also talk about the future uh, costs involved. So um, yeah, so, so that's basically to answer your question. Okay. And then let's see, what other questions do we have here? H. Chambers said, um, hi, Attorney Freckman, love your insider videos. I have a new question. Just got back surgery from a slip and fall and um, I was originally slated to get a microdiscectomy, but the surgeon added an additional laminectomy procedure. So I received two procedures during the surgery instead of one. Does this added procedure increase my claim by a lot? Asking for the entire policy or maybe more. Also have slap tear surgery coming up in the next few months. Yeah, I mean, that, that definitely should increase it because a microdiscectomy usually, you know, from my experience in here in New York, Again, it depends on where you are and, you know, depends. there are so many factors, right? So it's hard to me to like tell you what it's going to be worth. But in a microdiscectomy, like a percutaneous discectomy in New York, usually commands a settlement of anywhere from like 100,000 on the low end all the way up to I think the highest we've had. It was about close to 600,000, right? So in that ballpark, a few hundred thousand from usually two, 300 is probably the average. And if you have a laminectomy, that's a full-blown surgery. That's more serious. So that might command even into the millions, like I might, I could be like 700,000, 800,000, or even a million or more. So definitely it would add. And the fact that you're having a slap tear surgery, that's for the shoulder, that's also very serious. Uh, that could be another three, 400,000 on top of that. But like, again, you know, it's really hard to say because I don't like to say, you know, a procedure is worth a certain amount. I mean, on average, that's what other cases have settled for. But then, of course, you could have, you know, 20 procedures, but the jury doesn't like you or whatever, something else is wrong with the case, you can get much less. Or you might have just one procedure, but if you come across really well and you explain that, hey, this has really impacted my life, I'm not the same person I was before, then it comes across just very, very persuasive. You can get much, much more, you know, so it's, these are all just averages. It's very hard to make estimates based on... Um, you know, we're, we're really like drawing with broad strokes because we don't we don't have the file. We don't know. We just know it's a slip and fall. She was working and was chased by a dog. Oh, and it's against the homeowner. So the thing I would look for that is like how much homeowners insurance they have, because it sounds like you have enough procedures with these three, you know, discectomy, laminectomy, and the slap tear surgery. How much does that homeowners have? And also, where is it and everything? That would be that would be uh, helpful as well. Okay, let's see what other comments we have. Bruce Joseph says, great content. Thank you so much. Yeah, and if you're watching, just let us know what you want to see. Like, you know, ask us questions or maybe you want to see certain topics. I'm going to also do some videos about um, different verdicts and different types of cases, car crashes, uh, maybe some recent verdicts, maybe some construction. I saw, saw somebody was asking about back surgery verdicts, arthroscopic surgery. So I want to get into some of those as well. Okay. I am Jay Hunter asks, I got hit by an 18 wheeler truck company. I hit my head and was diagnosed with post concussive syndrome. I had six bulging discs in my neck and a back area. I had four trigger point injections for the pain management. And I was also diagnosed with myofascial syndrome. The driver of the truck tried to flee the scene, but I chased him down for eight miles until he gave up and pulled over. What do you think my case is worth? Yeah, I mean, I have to know where it happened, but it sounds like if you have a post-concussive syndrome and it's a true traumatic brain injury, if you work it up the right way with neuroimaging, a neurologist, a neuro, uh, neuropsychologist, it could be a, a traumatic brain injury, then it could be a really big case. It could be worth millions. 
The back injuries also are serious, trigger points and bulging discs. Um, so I'd have to really review the file, but it sounds like at a minimum a few hundred thousand. See what other questions we have here. <clears throat> Herschel Irwin says, I was hit by a commercial trailer owned by Anderson Renewal being pulled by a subcontractor. The ladder racks on the side of the trailer stick out six inches past the wheel fender. The driver and passenger put me on a piece of plywood and carried me into camper and left me there. When I gained some cognitive awareness next morning, my girlfriend called the ambulance. No police showed at no time. Short of the story, severe concussion, hip and femur broken in six places, on the right, left ankle broken on both sides, two rods, pins, and cables on right, plate, 10 screws on the left ankle. My question is, can I sue both the driver and Anderson Renewal Window Company? Oh, and now my right leg is three-fourths of an inch longer after the rods and cable installation. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a crazy case. Yeah, I mean, definitely if you were hit by a commercial trailer and uh, if the trailer is owned by Anderson and then being pulled by a subcontractor, I mean, you would need to get like a real trucking accident lawyer who specializes in truck accident cases. What I would do is do a deep dive. You know, you have to get all of the information from the truck, like the, the, tr the, tra the tractor, owner operator, the trailer owner operator. Sometimes there's also broker or shipper liability, but it sounds like, it sounds like a good case. Um, and the fact that the driver just put you on a piece of plywood and carry you into some kind of camper, that's terrible. So um, yeah, the injuries are definitely serious. That could be a multi-million dollar case. I'd have to know where it happened, you know, and if you need any kind of help, like a local attorney, I could help you find someone, just let me know. But yeah, I think you'd be able to sue both. You'd be able to sue the window company if they own the truck, as well as the subcontractor who was driving it. Okay, let's see. Orlando Del Rio says, Hi, I had a slip and in a major department store in Florida. I had surgery for a meniscus knee repair to the right knee and a bulging lower back disc damage. I'm currently going to therapy, and I also hurt my left knee as well. What can I possibly receive for pain and suffering? They have not paid any medical bills yet. Yeah, so I mean, with slip and falls, the key is proving that they were at fault. The key is proving liability. So you'd have to prove what's known as notice. So um, if you had a torn meniscus with surgery, we've had a few of those with supermarkets and we've gotten pretty good results. I mean, it could be 300, it could be 400, it could even be over 500,000. Depends on the severity of the injury and also depends on the liability, right? If you could prove the liability and prove they were at fault, you're gonna get more money, as opposed to if you have a weaker case, you can't really prove they were at fault. If they knew, a key factor is notice. You have to prove they knew about the condition. Let's say you fell on a puddle. Well, if they caused and created the puddle, right? If they had a guy mopping and he creates the puddle, well, then they're liable. Or if they knew about the puddle, if the puddle, like say it leaked somehow, but it was there, you have witnesses that it was there for let's say, I don't know, two, three hours and they had all this time and they didn't find it or clean it up. Now they're also at fault. But if they say, hey, we, we don't know how this got there. We didn't, we, we didn't have any notice of it. Maybe somebody just, you know, a kid was playing or whatever, the, playing with one of the detergents and they, they took it and they spilled some detergent and then a second later you fall. Well, we can't, you know, stop uh, spills every second, right? And I guess they're right in that instance and that's why they can get the case dismissed unless you have that proof. So that's that's what I would look to. And also the injuries definitely sound serious. So the injuries should be worth a substantial amount. USA 007 says, very clear explanation. Thank you. Yeah, you are very welcome. Thank you. Um, Ashton last name says good content. Thank you. <clears throat> then we have a comment here. <clears throat> also comment about a short video.
Oh, somebody's asking about a 4.6 millimeter tonsillar herniation and whether you've seen this type of brain injury before. And I said, um, yeah, I mean, as long as the doctor explains and gives you what's known as causation, because that's very important in a case too, right? What you usually have is on the jury verdict report, uh, questionnaire that the jury has to answer, you usually have two questions. Number one, was the defendant negligent? Okay, so they could be negligent. But then number two, was the negligence a substantial factor in causing the injury? So then you have to show that the negligence caused the injury. So as long as you could show that the incident, you know, I don't know what happened, it doesn't say here, if it's like a slip and fall or a car crash, if it caused the tonsillar herniation, then yes, then it could be very serious because um, those types of injuries, from my understanding, are caused by a cerebral hemorrhage. So there's like a, a mass inside the brain and it expands and it leads to a hemorrhage, which is like blood. So that's a very serious injury. And he says, yeah, it could be caused by intracranial swelling. So yeah, that could be, if that happened from a car crash, definitely, that could be a really strong case. Oh, he says he's in Texas. Mm -hmm. And I think he's asking if it's a malpractice case because the ER doctor didn't address the issue. Well, I mean, ER, you gotta understand, emergency room in a hospital, they're not gonna really be able to diagnose or treat a brain injury. They're just kinda make sure you're okay. It's like triage, right? They make sure you're not gonna die, then they send you home. But they always give you that note, hey, follow up. So that's then the patient's responsibility. You really have to then, and this is where a lot of brain injuries don't get diagnosed, you really then have to go see a good neurologist and get treatment and then hopefully like that's why it's a good to have a medical legal team because the neurologist could then send you to the neuroradiologist neuropsychologist and they could do a whole battery of tests a whole medical coordination and workup of your injury uh, along with a lawyer then you could have all the proof you need to prove a traumatic brain injury but yeah i don't know if it would be malpractice i mean it could possibly be but um usually it's hard, but you don't really necessarily need malpractice because if it happened with a tractor trailer and they just simply did not find it in the ER, I mean, that's like usually what happens. They usually don't find it in the ER. It doesn't mean you have to sue the doctor for malpractice. You just have the injury, the tonsillar herniation from the, you know, the trucking crash, from the tractor trailer crash. So just add it to that case and tractor trailer hopefully should have enough insurance and then you should be able to get a really strong result so yeah feel free to reach out if you have any questions about that but it sounds like uh it sounds like a good case sounds like a really strong case that was from reginald williams okay joe says always great videos thank you so much Katie Bowen said, I had a ceiling fall on my head at an establishment, it was just sitting there, and all of a sudden it collapsed on me, and only me. Wasn't too many people there. I have a lawyer working with. Will I be compensated for my lawsuit I have filed against the establishment? I'm in the early stages of my case. So things are still up in the air as far as the amount of settlement. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you had a ceiling collapse, uh, and it happened to you at an establishment, I don't know what kind of establishment or where, but if, like, for example, if it's in New York and it's a restaurant or any kind of commercial establishment, yeah, definitely. If you have an injury, now you'd have to prove notice, you'd have to prove that they knew about it or they caused and created the condition, but it's not that hard. You get their repair records. Ceilings usually don't just collapse, you know, spontaneously. Something, there might be a crack there, there might be a leak, there's a reason why it collapsed, so it's important to get a good expert, go in there and take a look and figure out why it collapsed. So you have that as part of your case. Then also, um, you know, it depends on what your injury will be. So the fact that it's early is okay as long as you're getting your medical care. Make sure you keep going, getting your medical care. Then you build up your injury, you build up your medical records, and then also how it affected your life. And um, 
it should be a it should be a strong case. I mean, ceiling collapses are usually strong cases. Okay, the Kitty Channel says I had a truck accident with a semi truck that wasn't my fault. My lawyer is suing them for ten million. What are the chances of them settling the case without a trial? I've had numerous injections, RF ablation, and ACDF surgery. That's anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. So that's a really serious surgery. I also had numerous physical therapy and chiro visits. This was in New York. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely going to make you an offer. I mean, for sure. I wouldn't expect them to just offer you 10 million. You know, they're not going to do that because remember the insurance companies always want to save and protect their money and limit their exposure and risk. But they'll probably, you know, they probably start off with a, a lower offer. You might have to go to mediation once or twice and then the lawyer could battle with them and try to get you more. But it does sound like it could be worth a substantial amount. It could be, it could be worth definitely more than a million. Uh, it could be worked up to be even 10 million. It's possible, but it, it takes that amount of work and diligence and it, you have to have all the, basically all the pieces put together the right way to get a really large amount like that. And usually that happens at trial. Okay, then Godlike says, if the medical bills are more than the insurer's insurance policy limit, how does one recuperate that money? Also, how is pain and suffering or punitive damages claimed? If the driver at fault has 2550, but my bills are more than 50, how would you get more than 50 and get pain and suffering? Okay, so I mean, it, it's hard to say because every state has different laws on this, so it depends on where you are. But in New York, for example, you have a no-fault policy, which is a PIP policy for 50000 right? So that's the no-fault law. That's almost like health insurance. You go to doctors, and that 50000 pays the doctors, like the emergency room, the chiropractor, the physical therapy, the MRI, pays other people, right, for treating you. So you have that 50000 Now, if the car that hits you also has a minimum of 2550 you can then sue the car for bodily injury and get another 25,000 from the car because you're one person, 25 per person, 50 per accident. If it's you and someone else, like you and a friend, then you each get 25, right? And the most you get for the whole crash is 50. That's all they have for the crash. So even if you have like, 10 friends in the car, they all have to share the 50, you see? So that's how it works in terms of bodily injury. But the PIP is more like health insurance that goes to other people like doctors for, for, for treating you and for getting you medical care. So that's usually how it works. Now, there are always other ways to get more. Like, for example, if you have, let's say, a bigger policy, let's say you have 100, but the car that hits you has a 25. Once you get that 25, you have to be able to get that full 25 from them. You can get 75 more from yourself because you are a more careful, you know, you have more insurance. You have 100, they have 25. You've exhausted their 25. You get the difference from your, yourself. Uh, that's under insurance, so you can you can get another seventy five from yourself. So it just depends on the factors. But punitive is completely different. Punitive is meant to punish someone when the conduct is so egregious. Well, like for example, if they know somebody is like on drugs or somebody you know is tired, they can't drive, and they say you know what, go ahead and drive anyway, and then they're just endangering the public at you know willfully and maliciously. But that's a very hard standard to prove. A lot of courts don't allow for punitives. But so that's punitives. And then I think he's also asking what happens if the bills are more than, I mean, unfortunately, there's not much you can do. If it's a minimal policy, it is what it is. If sometimes the bills can be more than the entire policy, it could happen. And that's why I think they should raise the policy limits. They've raised it for some commercial vehicles, I believe recently. There was like a bad limousine crash in upstate New York. And after that, they raised it for the commercial uh, limits, but they haven't raised it for regular cars, they probably should raise it at least to a hundred because 25,000 is really low. And then the same person asks, can you ever get more than the policy limit? Yeah, you can, depending on, like I explained with the UM, or also you can get more, um, perhaps in a bad faith case, if you open up the policy. And he says that, oh, he's in California and the ad fault driver had a hundred thousand, but his insurance was 25. Okay, and he's working with a law firm in California. 
right? So underinsurance would only apply if you have more. If you have less, then it won't apply. But you might be able to send them a letter and say, look, my injuries are worth way more than your $100,000 policy. Tender the 100. If they don't tender the 100, and then the policy could become open, and then you can have bad, bad California does have bad faith. It's not, I mean, it's not that simple. There's a whole slew of things that you have to do to open up a policy and to have a proper uh, bad faith claim. But it sounds like potentially you could have it um, if the injury is warranted. So I would speak to your lawyer about that. Okay, let's see what other question we have. The lone man says, I was hit on by a Palisades Parkway November 16th of 2022. I suffered two herniated discs and a bulging disc along with a concussion. I have radiating pain down my legs and arms. I'm only 24 years old. I've been going to physical therapy, chiropractic and acupuncture for about five months. And I saw a pain management doctor and he wrote a prescription for an epidural steroid injection, which I rejected. I was driving for Uber at the time and had a passenger. The passenger needed surgery. My question is, since I rejected the epidural due to my age, will that lower my case? There's a one and a half million dollar policy. How much can I expect? I mean, you know, anytime you you reject something, I mean, sure, an epidural is not necessarily like, you know, in my experience, I don't really, to be honest, I don't really like epidurals because all they really do is they ma like they mask the pain. I'll show you. Like basically, here's here's an example of a, a spine, right? And you see this red part that's a herniated disc. Now, if I have an epidural, all I'm doing is I'm taking steroid medicine and I'm injecting it and it's going here. And guess what it does? It numbs the pain because I have this red part. It's leaking out of my disc, which is a healthy disc. You know, there should be like a circle. Everything, the spinal fluid should be contained. The nucleus pulposus should be inside the disc, not outside. Once it's outside, like the red part, it's touching the nerve roots. That's what's causing the pain right? So all that medicine is doing is it's just numbing the pain. It's, it's, it's like taking a Tylenol for a headache. It's preventing me from feeling the pain. And I mean, look, if you have three epidurals, it has to be a series of three. You could get more. Like I've had a case with three epidurals. I think it settled for like over 150,000. If you don't do anything, if you just have physical therapy, um, they might try to lowball you. They might try to offer you like 10,000, 20,000. Now, if you do need something, you might consider another procedure like the percutaneous where that's a little bit better because what they're doing there is they're actually uh, a striker decompressor spins and it um, decompresses, meaning it like suctions out the leak. Now this red part is gone, right? And now the disc is a healthy disc again. It's like a, maybe they, it takes about 15, 20 minutes and it's an in-office procedure, but that solves the problem. It's a discectomy in the sense that you're removing the injury from the disc and you're decompressing the disc. Now, if you don't do anything, you know, it just depends. You could maybe still get, a, I know this was, I, he said this was a very serious crash. It made the news. Um, I mean, that doesn't really matter whether the crash was serious. What they're going to look at is your injury and whether you even meet the serious injury threshold requirement. Because if this happened in New York, you have to have a serious injury threshold that you have to overcome. If you don't meet that threshold, you can get dismissed and get nothing. So be careful there. Make sure you get enough treatment and make sure that, um, but you could get substantial compensation without doing an epidural or without doing a percutaneous discectomy. Um, so, but, but that, that's basically all I could tell you. Um, it's hard for me to say how much you're going to get. If you had five months of treatment with two herniated discs, I mean, you could still get a substantial amount. It just depends how the case is being worked up. Is it ensued? You know, who's the carrier? Um, which state is it in? And, and things like that. But it sounds like it definitely has potential. And that's good that there is enough insurance, one and a half million or so. But if the doctors are recommending it, you might want to consider something. Not, not necessarily the epidural, but maybe like the percutaneous or something else, depending on what the doctors think you need. But... Um, yeah, so that's basically my, my, my answer. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Ray says, congratulations. Oh, he's talking about our $535,000 verdict that we had last month in a, the CRIPS, the Complex Regional Pain Syndrome trial. And he says, 
My lawyer is saying I got, my medical bills are 20,000. He's saying that my case is worth under 140,000. And he's saying he doesn't want to take it to trial when I said I want to go. And he got mad and cussed and yelled at me. I don't understand these lawyers. I wish I had a lawyer like you. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like a lot of lawyers just don't want to go to trial. I don't know why. But, you know, a lot of lawyers, maybe they have a lot of cases and they feel like, hey, I can't take every case to trial, so I have to pick and choose. You know, I don't know the reason, but a lot of lawyers don't like to go to trial. Also, you know, the fact that they have money on the table, like if he has 140 on the table, he might think, well, that's something. Let's just take that. As opposed to going to trial, then you risk everything, right? Because you could get zero at trial, but you could also maybe get a million or more. So if it's worked up the right way, it definitely has potential. But yeah, you definitely don't want a lawyer who's afraid to go to trial. I think I spoke with this person, actually. I don't know if this is the case in Oklahoma, but I remember a few years ago, he had uh, called me and we chatted, but for whatever reason, he had all these, like, basically he was giving a lot of the arguments that the insurance companies give and the defense lawyers give. Like, I shouldn't get a lawyer. I should, you know, it's not worth that much. And so for whatever reason, um, I guess he hired someone else or, I don't know if this is the same person, but I remember I spoke to somebody. It just rings, it just remembered it now. I think he was out in Oklahoma and he had a pretty good case. It was like a commercial truck hit him and he had pretty serious damage from what I remember. I don't know if this is the same Ray, but yeah, feel free to reach out. I'll be happy to help. I don't know if I could help now. Maybe it's a little too late, but I'd be happy to help if I can. And then he also says, and my lawyer told me that we can just stop working together. And all I was doing was asking him questions. Oh, that's not a good sign. I mean, if asking questions makes the lawyer not want to work with you at all. That's not a good sign. But you should definitely yeah, have, a, have a, maybe have a meeting, go there and meet with him and uh, sit down face to face and talk with him because that is kind of weird. Okay. Then Araf says, also on the video about the $535,000 verdict, he says, seven years to get to trial. That's honestly crazy. Honestly, listening to all the stuff the judge did, if they had let it play out properly, I think it could have been a million. Some judges are just horrible for no reason. Was this in the Bronx? Because no way it took that long to get to trial. Maybe New York is different. I know here in LA, usually it's two, three years. Yeah, I mean, usually it is two, three years. This case took a little bit longer. I mean, with the pandemic, we got a little bit delayed. Also, it was an infant. And I forget why, I forget now, I have to look at the file, I forget why, but the case did take a little bit longer um, to get all the way to trial. Um, there might have been some delay with being able to depose somebody. Um, but yeah, usually the cases, not all cases take that long. But this case was an older case. And you know, when I was doing the trial and I, I told some other lawyers, they were actually surprised that I got a trial. They were like, you're getting a trial? They were like, wow, because I have all these cases and I'm not getting any trials. And that maybe that's why, because it was an older case and they had to get it, um, they had to get it uh, out finally. But now it seems like they're re reopening the courts a little bit better. And now, uh, you know, cases are starting to go to trial a little bit more. So that's good. And Amanda Lynn Gibson says, COVID, yes, that's one of the delays. But my case was delayed because the defendant was in prison for trafficking heroin and fentanyl. Oh my God, that's crazy. I mean, if somebody is doing something that bad, you could probably get that, you know, get that um, if he's in prison, especially if he was on some kind of, if he had a conviction, you could probably use some of that in your case and, and get more, more money because of it. Yeah. Let's see what other questions we have. Circumnavigate says, congratulations on the verdict. Do you think that they will appeal and stall the process? I, you know, I don't know. It's hard for me to say. I don't think they're going to appeal, although they didn't make any post-trial. I think 15 days have already passed and they haven't made post-trial motions. Usually you have to do it within 15 days or ask for an extension. So it seems like they're not going to do it. But you know, if they do try to appeal or do anything like that, 
we do get 9% interest. Although you never know what's going to happen. Like, you know, it wasn't a huge, huge verdict. Like it wasn't 50 million, it was 535,000. But it was a case where there was minimal treatment. There were like, I think, three hospital visits and one uh, or two doctor visits total. You know, very, very little treatment. There was that CRPS, which was confirmed by one of the neurologists. But if uh, the appellate court, which, you know, is conservative, says, you know what, that's too much, knock it down to like 200,000, then that would be really bad because now, you know, we get 9% interest, but now we get knocked down. So we'd have to see, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that they just pay it. I'm hoping that finally, after seven years, they play fair, they pay, they won't pay even after you get a verdict. What, do, what else do you have to do? It's like getting a little bit ridiculous with some of these carriers. Okay, then Guru Mob 89 says, great information. And he's talking about the 535 verdict as well. Thank you. And then Kevin says, I was recently in a rear end accident. The party who hit me from behind stated they were getting chased by another car, later pointing a gun at him, causing him to swerve, hitting me from behind. The party who hit me described the car as a Mustang. I did not see any Mustang at the time, nor did I remember seeing any Mustang. He had witnesses saying he saw the Mustang chasing him, but he did not see the Mustang pointing the gun. I filed a claim with the party that hit my insurance and got a denial. The police report said road rage may have been a contributing factor, but not 100%. I'm not sure why I got denied. Do you have any advice? This happened in Texas. And right now I'm stuck with the medical bills because the party who hit me has insurance, but I cannot file UM because he is insured. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure about that fact pattern. It seems like the guy could be making up a story I would just get like a good local lawyer and have him help you, have him or her help you. That's like the best thing I could say. It's hard for me really to say because, you know, um, I mean, even if there was some kind of road rage or somebody was pointing a gun, but that wouldn't give him an excuse to, to hit you. So um, it's still an accident and it's still not your fault. So why wouldn't you be, be entitled to get your medical bills paid or to have a claim? I'm not really sure. But I would definitely get like a local lawyer to help you. Let's see what other questions we have. Becky Gullery. I had a complete spinal fusion from my lumbar to my cervical done in two different surgeries. Three years later, it's a horrible pain. I don't get out of bed. The only way I'm out of pain, my world is seen through my den window. Oh my God, that's so terrible. My pain clinic installed a pain pump in my spinal cord for morphine. My neck will not turn from side to side, up or down. When I stand up for 20 minutes to start dinner, I have to cook a little and lay down. Yeah, and I see the spinal fusions can be very, very serious. That's why a lot of the time they command like millions and millions of dollars because it's, it's for pain and suffering, but it's also for future medical care because they're very serious injuries. And unfortunately, the spine is not something that medicine can cure just like that. You know, you, they, they, the only way to really fix it is to take out that disc. Like I was showing earlier with the, her, what they have to do is take out the disc, put in an artificial disc, then they have to screw in a plate into the vertebrae, into the bone. And then now you have less mobility because you have this plate in you so it's a very, very serious injury. It could definitely be very big. Okay, I think we're almost at the 40 minute mark. I see the next question is from a Gideon Yaw. What would a defense attorney say to defend his client who is a store employee that assaulted someone in the head with a baseball bat. And somebody else says, nobody would want to defend him. That's assault with attempt to murder. Yeah, absolutely. That's a terrible you know, injury, the terrible thing. But I think one of the ways that they could defend it from a civil uh, lawsuit perspective is to argue that the employee was not acting in the course and scope of his employment. So the store employer, let's say it's like a 7-Eleven, right? You have a 7-Eleven, so you're suing the 7-Eleven and it's one of their workers. So what they would argue is, hey, this worker, just like for whatever reason, he wasn't acting as a worker for 7-Eleven. He just went and did some crazy spontaneous thing. You know, we don't understand why. So kind of like sue him, but we're not liable because we never, 
you know, told him to do that. He wasn't acting in furtherance of his employment. And so in New York, from what I've seen, reading some of the case logs, I've dealt with, dealt with a few of these assault cases, that type of defense actually works sometimes because our presidential case law on this issue is not that plaintiff friendly, unfortunately. So that's one of the ways that it could um, be defended. But I would speak to your lawyer if you have a case like that. Okay, let me see. Araf says, since you got your JD from Texas and then you did the Texas bar, are you allowed to study at a university out of state and then do the bar for a different state? And after the Texas bar, did you have to do the New York bar separately? Yeah, I did. Actually, the way I did it was I was from New York. I just went to law school in Texas. So I went down there and I went, finished my law school there. I came back to New York and I took the New York bar first and I passed the New York bar, uh, which was a very difficult bar. I had to really study it a lot, memorize a lot. Um, and then later on, I was already working as an associate in a law firm in downtown Manhattan. And I just kind of had this thing like, well, why did I, you know, I'm from Texas. I, I went to law school there. I should probably take the bar. So I, I studied and I went back down and I took the bar and I passed the, the Texas bar. So I'm admitted in both places. But I think in most states, there's a multi-state bar and then you can wave in after five years. Some places you cannot wave in. I believe California and Florida are two states you cannot wave into. You have to take the bar. So if I wanted to, like for example, practice in Florida, I'd have to go and study again and take the bar there. Or, you know, I could associate with someone who's admitted, like hire an attorney or work with an attorney, partner with an attorney who's already admitted. That's allowed. But if I wanted to practice myself, then I'd have to take the bar in California and Florida. But in other places, you could wave in after... Um, after a certain after a certain period of time, usually it's like five years if you're in good standing. In USA 007 says very well explained. Thank you so much. Philip Satili. I just finished a deposition, five different attorneys representing five different companies for seven hours. How long after this does your case get put on the calendar for trial? It's going on six years now. Wow, that's kind of crazy. But I think like for the most part, you know, if your deposition is over, now remember, that's your deposition, you're the plaintiff. Your lawyer now has to depose the defendants and ask them questions. So depending if, if it's five different you know, attorneys, they might have five different, at least five different witnesses. So that could take a few more months, and then hopefully after that, maybe six months, maybe a year, and then put it on the trial calendar. But I would definitely ask your attorney about that. <clears throat> okay, let's see what else we have here. Maybe let's do like one more question and then we'll save the rest. I think we're about eight days or nine days out right now. From being current. And maybe later this week we'll do one where we go live again. I like that idea. Maybe I'll try to do it live with an app or with YouTube so I can actually read the questions and just like chat with you and see we can get some kind of interesting conversation going about what you really care about. That would be really cool. So let's do that maybe for this Thursday. And then I'll try to do a few topic videos too. I'll try to uh, come up with some, uh, maybe some brain injury, some fusion, some uh, trucking. Um, I know somebody was interested in arthroscopic surgeries or just maybe we could talk about some recent verdicts that we've had. Um, we had a few interesting settlements here in our firm. Maybe I could use those cases. I think one case recently settled. It was a little bit of a tough case. It was a trip and fall but it went for a pretty good, it went for over a million. So I could talk about that case. And we had a medical malpractice case that also settled for like 1.25 million. That was an interesting case. I could talk about those. And then we have a few cases coming up for trial. I think we have one trial, possible trial in May. So I'm gonna talk maybe generally about that case. Um,
Mars Black says, hi, I was in Queens, Queens, New York, and I was hit by a tow truck making a left turn head on. I had shoulder surgery and I was going to have two back surgeries. How much do you think that's worth? I mean, we'd have to see how much insurance they have, but if it's a tow truck, if it has a million, let's say, with two back surgeries and a shoulder surgery, you should be able to take that full million. Could be more worth more than that if they have excess or umbrella. So I would definitely find that out. But that's a serious, serious case. And then Araf says, if the plaintiff lawyer gets the defense to stipulate to liability, so 100% fault is on the defense, it's like a rear end, and that case goes to trial, would they still have to pay interest? Now, they might not have to pay interest if it's a stipulation, unless the stipulation in the stipulation, because stipulation is like a contract, right? You stipulate, you agree to certain terms. So what you stipulate to has to be in there. Now, if they stipulate that they're going to pay interest, then, but I, I, usually people won't stipulate to that. A judgment includes the interest, so you'd have to get a judgment. Okay, and then Ella Daz says, thank you for sharing. Yeah, now we're about seven days. And Darren Williams commenting on um, this older video, this is a few years ago, lawsuit value over shoulder surgery. What is my case worth? And then he says, how do those values in the video compare to slap tears uh, with bicep tendinosis? So, I mean, yeah, slap tear is usually fixed with an arthroscopic surgery as well. So if it's that kind of tear, it's probably in the same range, anywhere from like 150, 100, up to like 500, depending on the severity. Sometimes they have to put out like an anchors or a more serious uh, shoulder surgeries. Those go for more, though. We had some go for 650, 750. Um, and he says it seems high for a worker's comp. Yeah, well, I'm not talking about workers' comp. I'm talking about third-party injury lawsuits. I don't know the values for workers' comp. Workers' comp, there is no real value. What they do in workers' comp is they just pay you your lost wages and they pay you your, um, you know, your medical bills get paid. So again, they're paying other people for giving you medical care. They're not really paying you. I mean, you're getting the medical benefit and medical care and then they're paying you your lost wages. There are certain workers' comp settlements, like in New York, we have something known as a Section 32, where you can get a settlement, a lump sum, and you stop getting those uh, monthly payments or bi-weekly payments, you get a lump sum. But I'm not too familiar with that. I don't really do workers' comp, so I don't want to, you know, um, tell you that. I would speak to a comp lawyer. Okay. Okay, so I guess we're pretty much good to go. We're about seven days behind. So maybe in the next video we could catch up and we can get current. And then as well, we'll do the live like we talked about and some other topics. Okay, everyone, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to our channel. Let us know what questions or comments or topics you want to see for future videos. We are here for you. Have a great day and uh, we look forward to speaking to you very soon. Bye-bye.